you think about this statement. If you're 99% sure that you're saved, then you're 100% lost. Does it bother you? It bothers me. It bothers me because I understand what it's like to go through seasons of my spiritual life doubting as to whether or not I was truly saved. And hearing a comment like that triggers just this overwhelming anxiety and fear. It's spiritually paralyzing. But I don't like it now, and it frustrates me, because I know that it's a lie. Amen. And I know that all that it does is rob true Christ followers of their joy and keeps them from effectively living the Christian life. I believe that doubt is a universal problem. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how educated you are. And it doesn't matter how long you've been walking with the Lord. Sooner or later, we can all be vulnerable to a doubt that just strikes us with this fear that keeps us from living that effective Christian life. And that's why John wrote the letter of 1 John. In the passage we're looking at today, 1 John 5, 13 through 21, he specifically wrote to Christians who were doubting that they would receive eternal life. And he wrote it to assure them that they would. Pastor Paul has been reminding us that this isn't our home. But we're going to our home. And so, if we're going there, let's go with joy, hope, peace, and love. And today, as you're thinking about going to this home, I want you to be encouraged to walk away from doubt and to walk into the new year confident that you have eternal life. John wrote this passage, and, and, and in it, I want to highlight three spiritual benefits that everyone has who has put their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. So if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you have surrendered your life to Him and trusted Him for salvation, then you can rest assured that all of these spiritual benefits, they all apply to you. Let's go ahead and dive into it. First, belief in Jesus guarantees eternal life. Look with me at verse 13. Now, verse 13 is not just the key verse for this passage. It is the key verse in John's purpose for writing the whole book. In verse 13, he writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Here's what happened. False teachers had come into the church, to all of the local churches around Ephesus, and they were teaching that Jesus was not necessary for salvation. And that those who would put their trust in him as the son of God would not get eternal life. And hearing this over and over and over again caused people to start doubting and wondering, did what I believe in the beginning, was it really true? And John's message to them was, yes, it's true. They are wrong, and you are right. You are right to believe that Jesus was everything that you need. And he gives us some tests throughout the book. These evidences that we can see whether or not they're in our lives 
to see if God has done a life-changing work. And they're boiled down to really two. Obedience to God and a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's how it works. When we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and put our trust in Him, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and He changes our hearts. And when He changes our hearts, that changes what flows out of our hearts. And what flows out of our hearts just naturally as believers is a desire to obey God and a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you've trusted him for salvation, and you can look at your life, and you love your brothers and sisters, and you are obeying God, then you are guaranteed salvation because of what Jesus did on your behalf. There was a couple flying over a river in New Jersey. Christopher... And Denise, it was January 25th, 2013. Their plane crashed into the Hudson River. And as their plane was sinking, Christopher frantically called his wife. And he said, don't, don't say a word. I've got to tell you something. And he told his wife and his daughter he loved them because he didn't think he was going to make it. And then he hung up the phone and immediately called uh, 911 and frantically was describing what was happening as their plane was sinking and the phone cut off and immediately they had to abandon the plane and when they got into the icy water of the Hudson River the current began to push them to the middle of the river enough of the call was heard for river pilots to be dispatched to try and go find them but after 25 minutes, hypothermia was setting in. Christopher was losing consciousness. And he had lost all hope. But at that 25-minute mark, the rescuers arrived, pulled them both out of the water. And they both made a full recovery. A couple days later, a reporter asked Christopher about what had happened. And this is what he said. Without those life preservers, we never would have survived that crash. Your belief in Jesus Christ then allows you to make Jesus your life preserver. And it doesn't mean that bad things will not happen to us. But what it does guarantee is that life preserver will keep you afloat until you reach the shore of heaven. If you've trusted Jesus, your salvation is guaranteed. Look at John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come to judgment, but passes from death to life. If you're struggling with doubt about whether or not you're going to receive eternal life, I want you to know that that's okay and that's natural. But it's not okay to stay there. The reason John wrote this is because he wanted them to push past doubt to live in the security of their salvation. And so I want to challenge you to push through that and allow God to strengthen your faith in what he has done for you. One place to start is Go to God and ask Him what is causing that doubt to spring up in your life. And it could be a variety of things. It could be disobedience to God. 
It could be suffering. It could be a lot of things. Ask God to show you what is causing that doubt. And then begin to seek Him, asking Him to change your heart in that area of struggle. And I believe that He will answer that prayer. But the other thing I want you to do is to preach the gospel to yourself. When that, when that, when that doubt starts to spring up, instead of going into a downward spiral of fear and discouragement and worry... Change the conversation you're having with yourself and remind yourself that there was nothing you could do to earn your salvation and there's nothing you could do to lose it. That Jesus Christ was good enough to make you fully acceptable to God and there will be nothing you will ever have to do to contribute to that. Jesus is enough to secure your eternal life. Just change the conversation you have. One, believing in Jesus guarantees eternal life. Two, belief in Jesus ensures answers to prayers. Look with me starting in verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that we should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin. But there is a sin that does not lead to death. First, I want you to understand the difference between the sin that leads to death and the sin that does not lead to death. It's simple. The sin that leads to death is any sin that is committed by someone who has trusted Jesus for salvation. Because the work Jesus did through his life, death, and resurrection will be applied to that person's life, and they're forgiven. Those are forgiven sins. The sins that lead to a death, a spiritual death, are any sins committed by a person who does not believe Jesus is the Son of God, And has not trusted him for salvation. That's the difference. And what he is telling us here. Is that if you pray any prayer. That is consistent with the will of God. Then you can believe that that prayer has been answered. In heaven the moment you asked it. That you already possess the answer. Because that's what God's going to do. That he will answer it. And then he gives us a specific example of the kind of prayer that we can pray that is according to his will. And it comes in the form of a command that is motivated by love. And that command is if you see a brother or sister in Christ sinning, then you pray for them. Pray for them to overcome that sin. That that sin won't get a stronghold on their life. And if you pray for them, what will happen is God will bring them to a place of repentance. He will forgive them. And he will ensure for them, for me, for all of us who are praying for each other, that we will be secured until we hit heaven. That he will answer that prayer. I remember a Christmas morning when I was in fourth grade. I was sitting in the middle of my grandmother's living room and my entire family was there. My mom and dad, my brothers, my cousins, all my aunts and uncles, my grandparents, even my great-grandparents were there. It was a big crew. And as 
we were finishing opening presents, my aunt called me out for having a bad attitude. Now, when I got down there, I was excited about opening my gifts. But then I opened up a paint kit. I opened up some dorky shirt with a gorilla on a skateboard (laughs) and a bunch of other stuff that I didn't want. (laughs) Meanwhile, my brothers are ripping open BB guns, remote control cars, Nintendo games. And she goes, what's the matter? You don't like your gifts? Like, no, I don't like my gifts. Like, what did y'all do? Just find a bin of stuff nobody wanted and think, hey, this will be great for Nick? Like, was all the cool stuff gone? A a girl's bike would have been better than this. I didn't say any of that. (laughs) I didn't tell her what I was thinking. I can't even tell you what I was thinking. (laughs) And it's not because I don't remember. She's like, this is great, thanks, thanks for everything. And then I went to bed. The next day, I was still mad. So I went to my uncle and I was like, what's up? Like, why didn't I get any of the cool stuff? And he said, Nick, you never told us what you wanted. (laughs) Well, we didn't know what to get you. I thought that was a lame excuse, too. (laughs) But here's the truth with us and God. It comes out in James 4, 2b, verse 3. You desire and do not have, because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. We know that God, and then John 9, 31, we know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Some of you don't have answers to your prayers because you're not spending time with God asking Him. You're not seeking Him. And then others are in a pattern of asking for stuff that doesn't benefit anybody but you. It's for your own purpose, for your own pleasure, for your own benefit. And understand that it's okay to ask God for another job situation. It's okay to ask God for a reliable car. It's okay to ask God for a better financial situation. But our prayers are not going to be according to His will if they only benefit us. If the motivation isn't for His glory and for the benefit of other people. And not just, not just their physical benefit and their health benefit, but for their spiritual benefit. The guarantee is that if you belong to Jesus and you ask anything according to God's will, He will answer. And you need to know that it is never selfish to pray for yourself. In fact, it's foolish not to. Just pray within the guidelines of Scripture. And God will work in and through you and use your prayers to accomplish His good for His glory and for the benefit of other people. And you will benefit too. So just start doing this. If you see your brother or sister in Christ sinning, don't talk to other people about it. You don't even initially need to go talk to them about it, according to this verse. Just commit to talking to God about it and trust 
that he's going to help them work through whatever they need to work through to get to a place of repentance and a right relationship with God. Ask that that sin won't get a stronghold in your life. And if you're like, Nick, I, I don't know, where would I, where would I see people sinning? I was like, well, everywhere. But if you need a good prayer guide, just invite as many of your Christian family from our church to be your Facebook friends. People sin on there all the time. Just use it as a prayer guide. But seriously, when you see somebody sin, just know that you can go to God on their behalf. That's what he's commanded you to do out of love. And that that prayer is always consistent with his will. He'll answer it on their behalf. One, belief in Jesus guarantees eternal life. Two, belief in Jesus ensures answers to prayers. Three, belief in Jesus provides spiritual protection. Look with me at verses 18 and 19. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. This is simply saying that if you have been born again, that if you have been saved and received a new spiritual life, you will no longer live in a habitual pattern of sin. This is not teaching sinless perfection. If it was, John would be contradicting himself because a few chapters before, he clearly said to believers that if you claim to be sinless, you are calling God a liar. So he is not saying sinless perfection. He is saying that when the Holy Spirit comes into our heart, we find ourselves in this union with Jesus and God the Father. And in that relationship, God keeps us from living in a consistent pattern of sin, a sinful lifestyle. The idea is that we're growing in holiness. The idea is that we're becoming more and more like Jesus every moment, every day, every week, year by year. That we're growing to be more like Christ and a sinful lifestyle is not the characteristic that marks our life because Jesus protects us from that. But then it tells us he protects us from the evil one. The evil one is the devil. And what he's saying is that Jesus will protect us in a way that he will not allow Satan to grab hold of us and hold on to us and destroy us. We can continue to be tempted by the devil. We can continue to be under spiritual and demonic attack. But The devil will not be able to overpower us. He will not be able to control us. He will not be able to destroy us. When you put these two ideas together, here's what they're saying. That the one who is in us is greater than the evil one. And he will protect us from sin. And he will protect us from the devil. And that Jesus is in heaven right now, keeping us safe and keeping us saved. I was talking to a friend of mine who's in cybersecurity. And I said, how many cybersecurity attacks are are there in a year? He said, Nick, I couldn't even tell you. There are billions. Hundreds of millions Uh, Maybe in the billions. 
I said, okay, well, do they at least know how many of those cyber attacks are, are stopped? How many times they were ever able to keep a car from being hacked? Or a home video system from being hacked? Or a company losing their data? How many times has cybersecurity been able to stop that? And he said, man, we probably can't really tell you that either. But it's probably also in the hundreds of millions to billions. That is shocking. I read online that there is a cybersecurity attack on an individual person every 34 seconds. And that cybersecurity is a billion dollar industry just working to protect people from malicious attacks that affect their companies and their personal lives. And as I think about Jesus, I think about him like this perfect cybersecurity protection. And that he will protect us from the destructive nature and the attacks of sin and Satan. And we may struggle with sin until we get to heaven. But as he protects us from those things and makes us more like Jesus, we're going to stand before him one day, either after we die or when he comes back, and we're going to be perfect just like his son is perfect. And sin or the devil won't even need to be something we're protected from anymore. Just be forever with Jesus. And if you've trusted Christ, you can guarantee that he's going to protect you in the same way. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 3-5 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his mercy, he had caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The guarantee is that he will protect us. Until our salvation is complete and we're in heaven. Some of you are struggling to fight those spiritual attacks and you're losing the battle of sin. At least it seems like it. And one of the reasons could be, maybe the main reason, is because you're just not spending time in the presence of Jesus. Spending time in the presence of Jesus is that place where our strength to resist temptation and to say no to sin, where where that strength is, is charged up. It's like a superpower. And so as you go into this new year, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to take time every day to spend time in the presence of Jesus. Time alone in a quiet, private place. Time where you can thank Him, where you can praise Him. Time where you can spend time in His Word, ask Him for things, and listen to what He has to say. At other times, just sitting silently in the presence of God, waiting on Him. And if you did that one thing every day, your relationship and intimacy with Christ is going to grow. And your strength to say no to sin and temptation and to respond faithfully in a way that honors the Lord to any spiritual attacks, you will have that. And it will flow out of that intimacy you have with Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you Spend time with the Lord in your private time. You need worship 
with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But you need that personal worship time too. So that's how I want to challenge you. Belief in Jesus guarantees eternal life. Belief in Jesus ensures answered to prayers. And belief in Jesus provides spiritual protection. The one thing I want for you who are believers here this morning is to move past doubt in any challenges that it provides for you. I want you to move into the new year excited about your salvation because the doubt and the fear and the worry and anxiety, it, it's not got a hold on you anymore. That can happen. And I want to ask that you will commit to the Lord this morning that you will fight to push past that doubt. No matter how mentally exhausting it gets, no matter how emotionally exhausting it gets, no matter how much you want relief, that you will not give up the fight to claim the assurance of your salvation and the guarantee that you will be in heaven. This passage teaches us some things that we can know with certainty. We can know that we have eternal life. We can know that God answers prayers. We can know that we will not practice sin. We can know that God will protect us from the evil one. We can know that we belong to God. And we can know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding of how to have a relationship with God and how to have eternal life. I just want you to move forward claiming What John says you can know. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and have trusted Him for salvation, that that those those are all no's that you can claim with certainty. But then there are others of you here and you don't have a relationship with Christ. You know deep down that you have not believed that Jesus is the Son of God. And even if you have believed the right things, you know that you've not truly trusted Him for salvation. There has been no heart change. I want to ask you to surrender your life to Jesus today so that you can walk out of here with the assurance that Jesus has saved you and is preparing a place in heaven for you. It comes with believing The testimony about God towards Jesus. The Father testified that He's the Son of God. So first, we have to believe that He is the Son of God. We have to believe that He was the one who came to provide salvation. Jesus, being God, left heaven and came to earth to be a person like us. 100% God able to forgive sin, and 100% man able to be the sacrifice for sin. And he lived a perfect life. And in that perfect life, on our behalf, he made a way for us to appear to God as perfect. When God looks at those who have believed, he's not going to see the sinners who deserve to be punished for all of eternity. He's going to see somebody perfect like his son because he's going to look at us through the lens of the Son's perfect life. But then He died on the cross for our sins, to be punished in our place. And when He was on that cross, He he took our sin, He took God's wrath, He took God's punishment for us, He took our failures, He took our shames, He took our embarrassments, He took our perfections, everything that kept us from... uh, that caused us to fall short of God's glory. He took away, and in its place, he offered us the righteousness of God. Once Jesus lived for us and then died for us, there was nothing keeping us from being accepted by God. Except for one thing. 
you. You're the only one keeping yourself from being accepted by God. All you have to do to receive that free gift is confess to God that you believe Jesus is God, that he died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. And that based on what he did, you can be forgiven and made acceptable to God. And you're so convinced that it's true that you surrender yourself to him with a commitment to live his way instead of your way. And when you do that, when you believe in that moment, you will be given new spiritual life and all the guaranteed benefits of salvation that I talked about today, they will all be yours. I want to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. If you're here this morning and you want to make that decision to follow Christ, then I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. This is not a magical prayer. We actually say the words in different ways all the time. What's important is what you believe. And this prayer is just a way to communicate those beliefs to God. And so if you want to do that and surrender your life to Jesus and trust him for salvation, then pray this prayer with me. I will pray one part and then you pray the next part. And then I'll pray the next part and you pray after me. Just pray what I pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. If you want to be saved this morning, pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I know that you love me. But I know that you can't accept me the way that I am. I'm a sinner and I've offended you. But God, I believe that Jesus is your son. That he lived a perfect life for me. Died on the cross for me. And rose from the dead. I believe that what he did is good enough to make me forgiven and saved. So God, come into my life and take control based on what Jesus did. I surrender my life to you I commit to living your way. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask that you keep your eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer this morning and for the first time, we're not going to doubt the last time, but for the first time you know you've surrendered your life to Jesus, would you hold your hand up just so I can see you? Man, praise the Lord. God, I ask, that you would help all who are here who have trusted you for salvation, who confess that you are the son of the living God, that this year you would help us to live in the newness of life, that you would not allow us to be paralyzed by the fear, the anxiety, the worry that comes with doubt. Give us an unshakable certainty in what you have done for us and let that be expressed through the way that we glorify you, love each other, and serve this community. And I ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.